to this month's meeting as you're taking your seats. I'd like to, well, first I'll introduce myself. I'm Stephen Elias, Dean of the Cat School of Business up on campus. Thank you. And chair of the board for the Alliance. I'd first like to recognize Mitch Dye with ImageNet as our oh. sponsor. First Mitch. Hey. <laughs> I won't say too much. I don't know why you put my name up here. It's image net. I want to say I appreciate everybody's support over the past 12 years that we've been here. And uh, if you find yourself in Grand Junction on Thursday, we're doing our grand opening and we're doing building up there. That's where I'll be. Thank you all so much. Enjoy the coffee. We need a cheap plug for the Center for Innovation. Mitch, thank you. We have a few uh, 3D printers now. Oh, uh, guests, do we have any guests here today? Please stand and be recognized. Take 30 seconds to introduce yourselves. I'm Tracy Anselmo. I'm the Interim Public Health Director for La Plata County. So I'm here on a, on a temporary basis to help get the local public health department launched here in, in La Plata County. I welcome any, um, anybody come up to me, make some time to chat. Look forward to meeting all of you. Thank you. You're coming up in a minute. We have three more here. Lisa, have you been here in the past? What's that? Have you been here in the past? This is my first time. Okay, well, you'll get to stand. <laughs> okay, great. <laughs> uh, so why don't we start in the back? Uh, Eric Gatorson, and I'm new to Durango, um, and I'm heading up to the commercial lending team at First Southwest Bank. I moved here from Minneapolis, Minnesota, and I was at a CDFI bank there, which is what First Southwest Bank is, the Community Development Financial Institution. So. Very excited to be here. My family's coming soon, so I miss them very, very much. So I'm happy to talk your ear off because I got uh, you're all by myself. <laughs> Next. Hey, my name's Christian Caldwell. I've been doing commercial appraisals on the Western Slope for about a decade, and I've kind of shifted gears to brokerage. I'm uh, working on a team at Alpha Properties with Dan Corman, and I'm excited to get to know you all. So thanks. Thank you. Uh, my name is Greg Murray. I'm the for some color. <laughs> Worked with the Bank of Colorado. I've been here about 12 years. You said, do you want to, to? Sure. I'll just introduce myself. I'm Lisa Poole. I, um, it, for those of you who knew Helen Kadich, I'm the new Helen Kadich. I work for Senator Hickenlooper as the Southwest Regional Director for the Senator. My name is Jay Curry. I'm a certified professional executive coach. Moved here in December, just in time for the snow. Uh, and uh, it's the first time I've been able to make it. I've been invited every every month for over a year. So glad to be here. Uh, Danica Frost, I'm not uh, new, but I want to reintroduce myself as the Chief Beverage Director at the Strader. <laughs> You know, time attendees, and you're you're speaking. You said, "All right, that's me." <laughs> <laughs> I think I mentioned a month ago that the alliance will always find a picture. It doesn't matter how far back they have it. <laughs> okay, Tim Walsworth. Forbid. Yes, sir. <laughs> Yeah, good picture. That is, that's a while ago. Back when all my hair was there. Uh, thanks for having me, Tim Walsworth. I run the Durango Business Improvement District. I just have uh, three things to give you guys some updates on. What do I do? Like right, right here? Yes, no. Nope. Space bar. Not what I, do. I don't think we have your slide. All right, cool. I'll just do it like this. Uh, first things first, happy to report that bid selection measure passed a couple of Tuesdays ago. Last Was that last Tuesday? That was a week ago. Wow. Um, so, you know, bid is funded by a little property tax on about 400 commercial properties downtown in North Maine. Uh, that creates uh, annual revenues of around $275,000. And that um, uh, mill revenue is going to sunset in 2026. So we went to our voters uh, last week and asked them, would they extend that core funding for 15 years? and happy to report, report that it passed with 80% in favor. So that feels pretty good. The bids core funding, 90% of our annual funding, it's in place for almost two decades. 
So you'll be seeing me around, probably not that whole time, but for, for a little while. So I'm happy, happy about that. And then we have two year-end promotions I just wanted everyone to know, know about. Um, the first is an event called Singing with Santa. It's how we kick off the holidays in downtown Durango. It's always held the day after Thanksgiving. So that is Friday, November 24th. It's 5.30 to 7.30 at Buckley Park. So I expect to see all of you there. Um, we do Christmas carols. We do free hot chocolate and cookies. Uh, we have we like the community Christmas tree. We have Santa photos with Santa for the kids. All that all that fun stuff. It's super great. Um, some new components though this year that we're adding to try to encourage people not only to come just to the event but come out and start their holiday shopping on that day. So we've got two new things. Um, first of all, if you shop on Black Friday at a big business that's restaurant or retail. Um, you can save those receipts and turn them in to be entered for a gift card drawing. We'll give out $1,000 in gift cards. Um, so spend $100, bucks, that's 250 you get one entry. 250 to 350 you get two entries. 350 or more, you get three, three entries. Um, the prizes, we'll, we'll draw one person to win a $400 gift card. So that's pretty good for shopping local. We'll do two $250 gift cards, and then we'll do one $100 gift card. Um, all the details on that are at singingwithsanta.org. Put that in your bookmarks, man. Uh, and then the last thing uh, is an annual promotion that we do. It's called our rewards program. And this one, of course, is holiday rewards. Bid has operated these successfully seven times um, since the holidays of 2020. Um, $860,000 spent at local businesses due to these promotions. And we feel pretty confident we'll get past a, mil a million bucks when this current one, the Holiday Rewards Program, is over. So here's how it works. This program starts on December 1st, happens to be Noel night. Um, so if you're shopping on Noel night, you can start saving your receipts. You shop at a bid business or a chamber of commerce business that's in one of five sectors, retail, food and beverage, personal services, attractions, or accommodations. Save those receipts and you'll turn them in on our website. Um, you, and, and then once you reach our spending levels, you then earn a gift card as your reward. Um, spend 200 bucks, you get a $25 card. You spend 400 bucks, you get a $50 card. You, get, you spend 750 or more, you get a $100 card. And there's 250 of those reward gift cards available. Um, you don't have to spend all the spending level in one place. You can mix and match up to 10 receipts to reach those spending levels. And all the details on that are on the bid website, downtowndurango.org. So we look forward to a great holiday season. Uh, uh, and just remind you, all of you guys, shop local this year when you can. Mayor Clark, thank you to all of our elected officials. You get to go first. Well, there's a story behind that, but this picture was actually during the uh, COVID uh, economic recovery task force days. So that's how old that one is. Hey, um, so we got an email yesterday saying that Matt needed to go first today. Thought, well, whatever Matt wants, Matt gets. So uh, I'm going to be here to tee him up just a little bit real quick. A few good slides. So, um, and Ignacio, I want to talk about a quick little project here. This is Dancing Spirits. It's happening. It started to visit this summer. We had a, a blessing. If you've not done a summer camp blessing for a facility, it's an amazing process to go through. Um, but what's really important about this is they had a little bit of snag in their funding, and that caused them to kind of shut down construction. Um, the next picture? That's all we got. Oh, that all we got? Um, it doesn't really matter. Okay. So there is a picture of uh, yeah, that's fine. There's a picture of uh, Casey getting a three hundred thousand dollar check two weeks ago that somebody donated to this cause. It really got things back and going. They're going to start construction here at the end of right after Thanksgiving. So this is going to be a great new facility in Durango. I bring it to your attention because I hope everybody will come out and utilize those resources. December 1st, we're having our Taste of Christmas. Yes, we are in competition with Noel Night. I get that, but we have a light parade and Santa comes in on a helicopter. Commissioner <laughs> 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 Salk, uh, Mass Salk, Olapata County Commissioner. Uh, you know, it's almost taken, what, three years to find out that if you throw a fit, you actually can get your way as an elected. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's why you're able to come in. 
a couple items here. We're in budget season right now. Uh, tomorrow during our BDT, we will have a final check-in on our budget, uh, giving any extra direction on our budget. And then December 12th, we will hope to, fingers crossed, keep our, uh, uh, to approve our budget for 2024. Regional weather radar station, um, really hopeful for the government not to shut down. Uh, we're still waiting for an FAA approval. Uh, should go through, but uh, we're hopeful that uh, the government doesn't shut down here. Uh, Treasurer's office, November 3rd, uh, Moni uh, Grushkin took office. Her term will be till January of 2025, and then there will be an uh, election. Uh, November 2024, there will be a ballot on who our next treasurer will be. Transfer stations uh, has been a hot topic in La Plata County uh, for Bayfield and the Marble area. And uh, great news is, is that uh, La Plata County contract reliable uh, waste services, which is a veteran owned business, which is great news uh, to operate in Bayfield and Marble. And Bayfield opened up as of yesterday and Marble will open up tomorrow. So that'll be up and running again. <clears throat> the other item last but not least is the planning department. I can now speak on this uh, briefly is that La Plata County is considered Primergy House for a solar application withdrawn. Uh, their contract was not complete. They had ample opportunities to be able to get that uh, application fulfilled. They did not. So they will have to resubmit it when, if and when they do. That's all I have for now. Uh, other than please reach out to me anytime. Don't wait for office hours. Uh, my web, uh, county website, my phone number and email is there. So please reach out to me anytime. Thank you. Take your sure way up. I'll point out there are some seats available up front for folks who are standing. I'll just be really quick. Um, as you probably read in the paper, our sales tax initiative did not pass, which we kind of expected in Bayfield. Um, so we're off to plan B with our budget. Um, we'll be in meetings tomorrow on that. So it just kind of means that our park plan, 600 people responded to in the town of all the things that they wanted and all the amenities. We'll probably have to wait. We'll have to find a way to fund those. Um, tonight uh, at our planning commission meeting, we have a public hearing to present our comp plan update. I'm super proud of, uh, there's about 12 individuals, resident, residents of Bayfield that got together and they've been working really hard the last year. I think they absolutely nailed the mission and the vision for Bayfield. So we'll be uh, updating that. And then I'll put my chamber hat on. Um, on January 11th, we are hosting a huge business after hours membership drive at the Billy Goat Saloon, six o'clock. Come have some food and drink and get entered to win a lot of prizes and let all of your Bayfield Friends, businesses know we are having that. And that's all I got today. All right, good morning. Um, OK, the Community Development Department is on track with the River City Hall, um, moving in, and they're going to be moving into the big picture um, uh, building. And that should be mid January of 2024. So everything's going smooth there. Um, the 2024 lodgers tax arts and culture applications are going to be out the end of this week. Um, and they'll be due the end of January. And so anyone with an awesome project, um, you want to submit for that lodgers tax, go ahead and um, go on to our website and do that. Um, deadline January 31st. Um, the leasing for locals below market rental subsidy voucher program opened for applications October 26th. Um, it's going to be open until November 1 or is it close? November 20th. What day is it? They extended. Oh, they extended it. Great. Thank you. I'm like, what day is it even? I just got back from vacation. So <laughs> I have no idea. Okay. Um, so that's extended. The program intends to increase the supply of 30 new multifamily affordable rentals to local workforce earning between 60 to 100% AMI. Um, the city has committed 771,000 American Rescue Plan Act federal funds and in partnership is working with a nonprofit partner housing solutions for the Southwest and the developer Four Points Funding along with on-site property management company um, to create the two-year pilot innovative housing program at the Gage Apartment. So that's a super cool initiative that we have starting. Um, we are advancing our land use development code amendments and updating the fair share program, um, which has been in the works for quite some time. And the proposed amendments will be presented at the next city council meeting on November 21st. Um, and, um, Updates to Article 5.4 Fair Share Housing are intended to reduce the barrier of no third party subsidy. So it's exciting. Um, changes to the Fair Share Administrative Manual approved by resolution are also required to be presented at that meeting and that public hearing. So if you're interested, I want to talk about it. 
pop over on November 21st to our meeting. Um, lastly, sustainability, City of Durango was awarded a 25,000 grant from the Colorado Water Conservation Board to run a turf replacement program in 2024 in conjunction with Visit Durango. The program's gonna provide advising and funds for projects to replace turf for more water efficient landscape. Dave from Mike French. Morning. Morning. If um, anybody does have workers that are under 100% AMI, so for a family of four, that's $102,000 a year. Uh, the, the, um, the program that Jessica alluded to is below market rental. So the city signed a master lease agreement with the Gage Apartments, which are right behind Home Depot. Strongly encourage you guys to get in line. She's extended the deadline for one week, so I think it's to the 27th. But uh, that's a that's a, a pretty pretty uh, a big deal for us to get some folks into those apartments. So brand new. That's the modular um, on the that, uh, that went up, and it's a phenomenal product. Uh, we did a walkthrough, and it's so it's a it's a great product. And strongly encourage you guys to to get some workers in there. Um, the Catalyst Fund, we uh, we received seven applications um, that closed uh, October 31st. The It's in committee now. You'll get reviewed uh, and funding will go out probably the first week of December. Uh, checks will be cut quickly thereafter. And uh, then we expect round three to be in the first quarter, probably late first quarter of 2024. And hopefully we'll have enough money left over to do a round four which will then be probably Q2 or Q3 in 2024. Um, so the seven applications, two of them are preservation projects, meaning uh, mobile home parks that requested additional funding for preservation of, of, those, uh, of those properties. Um, opportunity Now, Project Run. Um, if you recall, the uh, three-year $1.25 million grant from OEDIT to the Alliance in partnership with FLC, is for six micro certifications over the course of three years. We've landed on two uh, with the advisory committee. And the first two will be mid-level leadership, mid-level management leadership. And the second will be to accelerate the child care provider uh, business. And um, Melissa Linda, do you want to stand up and talk about the design sprint schedule for this week? Uh, so we have our first design sprint for that. So that's a big brainstorming session that we're going to have uh, tomorrow afternoon with our child care providers, our child care conveners, our um, early childhood councils all across Region 9. We also have some adult learners and hopefully we'll have some people from our more vulnerable populations come as well. Um, and so we are really excited to have these three hour brainstorming sessions where all these stakeholders can get together in a room and kind of identify in the case of childcare, what are the biggest needs? How can we best accelerate and provide uh, better wages and things for our workforce? And then on the leadership management side, that will be Thursday morning. We have uh, about 25 of our uh, leaders in that area, whether they are consultants, whether they are employers, market industries, which include healthcare, finance, utilities, energy, uh, human resources, uh, and energy. And we're really excited to get in a room with them to identify skills gaps when it comes to kind of promoting and upskilling workers to get into those kind of middle management positions that we know are really critical in our area. We know that we um, are having some brain drain uh, related to those. So super excited to get those started. That's kind of the kickoff, that's kind of the on-ramp. And then throughout December and January, we're also gonna have our faculty from uh, Fort Lewis College help us with curriculum development. And we're hoping to have both of those certificates running kind of simultaneously in April and May. So if you are a member of one of those target industries and you have any employees who you think, oh yeah, that could be pretty important where they are, um, let us know. We'll start recruiting participants. It's totally free for them to get the certificates. Uh, probably January, February, I'll start reaching out to people. Happy to chat more about it. Again, think of candidates that you have within your own organization mm -hmm. that would benefit from some kind of career development, specifically to leadership development. And um, again, we'll advertise that a little bit more come the front of the year. Um, the grant picks up the tuition, so it's subsidized, uh, and we're going to actively look to fill those classes 
with uh, with employers participating and sponsoring uh, participants. The RIK just had a retreat uh, last week. Um, the objective was to come up with goals for 2024, as well as funding sources. We'll probably start a committee uh, looking at uh, funding sources and evaluating different paths to a sustainable funding source. Um, if you have any interest, we'll again advertise that. We're going to go after different segments of the community to be represented, represent, representing um, their their industry or their segment and graphic in that uh, in that day. Last but not least, the um, the Southwest Economic Outlook is Tuesday, January 9th at this um, hosted by the Cats School of Business, and uh, it will be at FLC in the ballroom. It happens to be on the same day of the scheduled alliance meeting, which is the second Tuesday of the month. So we will postpone or actually cancel that monthly meeting and see everybody at that, uh, at that economic outlook. I think this is the 30th or 32nd. 32nd. And the 12th can be here for his 32nd. Yeah. <laughs> so we'll uh, we'll market that and advertise that in uh, in December. Um, so hopefully we'll see you guys there. Um, we're probably going to run five to ten minutes over today. We have a very diverse schedule. And with that, I'll talk over to you, Steve. Thank you, Mike. By the way, really quick in relation to the outlook, last year we added a speaker on supply chain. This year we added a speaker on healthcare in our region. We got some feedback that that would be of interest. But like Mike said, we'll message that out. There'll be more to come. Great for Chief Brammer to come up. Hello, I'm Bob Brammer. I'm the police chief for the city of Durango. And we're talking about pictures today. I guess that's a very, uh, <laughs> but I actually look very young in that picture. Do this job. Uh, it's no cave November, so my, my beard is much whiter this year than it was. Uh, definitely see the toll. But, um, thank you very much for having me here today. This is actually one of the, the funnest pre presentations that I get to do um, a couple times a year. And uh, seeing familiar faces and meeting new people within our community, the leaders, is a really good opportunity to project what the police department's doing in collaboration and partnership to, to make Durango and our broader community much safer um, for everybody to live and to work in. Um, so thank you again for that. Uh, so even this morning, a lot of people are asking, like, and police departments are really busy lately. And uh, so we have been trying to change our language in the police department by saying, no, we're not busy, but we really continue to give us lots of opportunity to do a lot of work. <laughs> so, uh, and our police department is doing fantastic work right now. And we've got a great support from our city council to be able to help us really kind of change and maneuver on what the police department is doing and try new things um, that are outside the traditional norm of what policing is. Typically, policing is just going to say, okay, hey, we just need more police officers, and we're going to throw more resources at problems, or just be reactive to situations. But we've had the opportunity to expand and explore some of these programs and say, okay, how can we do better? Uh, there's still, a, 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 I guess, a crisis within hiring police officers. There's a lot of people who don't want to do that. Um, you know, the market's different within the labor market. So it's hard to attract people and it takes a really long time and it's a huge investment to get somebody to where they can actually go out on the street and do their job. And um, what I mean by that is it takes someone two weeks to quit, but when we find a police officer, it takes us two or three months to vet them to make sure that they're even qualified to be that person. And then from there, we have to then put them in a police academy, which is typically a semester of school, and then we have to put them through another month of internal training so they can learn all the system <laughs> while we put them in the field for another 13 to 16 weeks with another officer to learn the job. So we're talking, you know, nine, 10 months before somebody's even on solo status. And then from there, how does that solo status translate into being proficient at the job, which takes another two to five years to be in good time? And our ranks, is, you know, we're across the nation right now are depleted. And so we got a lot of really young officers and we're doing a very advanced assignment. So we have major crime detectives in our agency that have two years experience, right? When, when I came on, it was like those guys are 15, 20 years to insult me at the dress. You know, I mean, that means we don't have that experience right now. We're working really hard with that. We're, we're getting our really uh, robust training budgets. We invest a lot of time in our people getting them out there to understand 
um, the, the, the nuances of the job and, uh, and, and it's been working. And so we are, if we look across the state, even across the nation, we're doing a good job. We're doing a really good job. And you guys are really proud of this agency that we've got working for you. Um, over the last year or so, we've really worked hard at trying to drive down our part one crimes. Part one, part one crimes are classified by the FBI as major crimes. So that's going to be like your murders, your homicides, your rapes, your thefts, your burglaries, your auto theft, arson. So there's, there's this classification of crimes that are out there. We spiked in like 2020, 2021. We went really high, but nationally, everybody did. There was a lot of reform issues, legislation that, that really played a lot of dynamics um, in law enforcement and made it really challenging. And people took advantage of that. Bad people took advantage of our communities and our societies. We're now stabilized here in Durango back to the 2017, 18, 19 numbers. So we're really doing well as far as balancing that down, um, as far as our major crimes go. Which is surprising because if you look across the state of Colorado right now, the state of Colorado is having a really hard time. I mean, we're the state of Colorado is number one in auto theft. You know, they're like number two or three in property crime. And a lot of that comes from like Pueblo and Denver and Colorado Springs and front range areas. But there's a lot of things going on within our within our state that is, is challenging. And so when we look at our numbers and compare, we're doing really well. Uh, and like I said, we're really kind of in. We we look at our, our quarter three statistics, and this is kind of nerding out, but uh, our part one crimes, you know, we're, we're still down uh, 3% on violent crime, and we're down about 22% in property crime. And so we're, we're compared to there. Uh, unfortunately, we had some pretty major events for this last quarter. This influenced our quarter four reports, you know, with a couple shootings that were completely random. And, you know, with, with the Santa Rita Park shooting and then the one at the Walkie Lot. Those are things that we know are anomalies. We don't see those things here in the I mean, We've had shootings before, but we haven't had fatal shootings here for a number of years. And again, the work that the officers and sectors are doing, even with, with, with the assistance of Colorado Bureau of Investigations and the Sheriff's Department, we were able to get everybody in custody. We've got a fantastic case to present to the attorney's office. We're going to get some justice out of this. Uh, but it could create a rift in our community. There's a lot of victims out there. Uh, it creates a lot of unsureness within our community as a whole. And uh, I just want to stand up there for you guys saying, hey, we'll put the tools together and we're trying to do things right now to build some of that. But one of the biggest things that we continue to see here and elsewhere is we need community. Um, just like any major incident, mass shooting that occurs out there, you look at it from after the event occurs, and everybody's like, oh, yeah, you knew about that. We saw that. You know, they, they talk about that, right? It's all the signs are there. See something, you got to say something. We got safe to tell place. You know, there's other anonymous reporting signs uh, that are platforms for to be able to get the information to us. But if we don't know, we can't put that. And this is something we're working really hard with, um, with, with Maxis and some of our other partners to develop these threat teams because we can be preventative and we can prevent, right? And but we need the community support and, and these partnerships to make that actually happen. And then once we do have somebody identified as a threat, we how to manage that person as well. And so this is a big thing that the guys been working on uh, across the state. You know, there's different organizations with, with Colorado Bureau of Investigation and Colorado public health to be able to say how do we do this the school districts are truly good at it. Uh, how do we share those across you know the different from the community to the back to save us a whole so again you know we need to be active bystanders within our community not just bystanders within our community. So it's going to be real important that we continue to spread our words to our employees to our, our families and everything else that that stewardship that's going to help out. One of the things we uh, are greatly challenged with right now is quality of life crimes. This is the one that everybody sees on our streets every day. Um, we see these little nuanced things. The council has been very supportive in our effort to perform the municipal court. Um, the municipal court has lagged behind in a lot of the judiciary and legislative updates that have gone on through bail reform and bond hearings and you know all these all these different components that, that, that hinder the ability for us to do our job within the community and hold people accountable and provide its terms for their actions and future actions. Um, is everybody from Strader here today? Yeah, sorry. Uh, we're dealing with a significant problem down Strader right now. We've got a, a recidivist in our community that has committed well over 70 offenses in just this calendar year. She's probably going to make 100 by the time she goes to trial in January. We're stuck. 
right? Because it, 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 low level offenses, the state has put these restrictions on us where we can't take somebody to jail unless they meet certain criteria. And um, you know, there's orders in place that, that if we do take them to jail, they're automatically released. So they're out, the person who takes jail is actually out of jail before we get out of the jail is doing our thing. Uh, that hinders our ability to provide insurance. People on the number of you know, so the city manager and the chief over in Alamosa, they're out the same problem, Grand Junction, same thing. So there's these challenges across the state that everybody's wrestling with right now. Um, we're we're going to be going to a full time judge in January, and with the support of the council, this is hopefully going to be able to make that change. And we're going to advance that system to be able to deal with this problem because this is probably the Greatest tool that we have to influence people's behavior and keep our community safe at uh, low levels because we don't really always experience this high level crime. So, quality of life is huge, of course, and we want to continue to make sure that uh, we're focusing on that. And that, that comes with partnerships as well. Uh, you know, I mentioned the straighter because, you know, we have multiple, multiple violations. I don't know why this individual likes that hotel that much, but <laughs> she does. And um, it, it's, it's really frustrating for us, for the patrons, and for, for, for the business owners as a whole. So we need to know these things so we can respond and can help partner with this and actually try to come to solutions. Because I don't want to continue to respond to problems, I want to solve problems. Um, that's how we get things forward. So that's kind of on that one. Uh, and, well, it's a national topic. It's actually an international topic. Um, <laughs> you know, I'll tell you that right now. I had a conversation with this before. They're talking about meth on our resurgence. Meth, uh, our seizures for meth is about half of what they were last year. Our fentanyl has doubled since last year. Okay, so we were up to well over 10 pounds of fentanyl that we seized this year. That's just what we've seized. And 10 pounds of fentanyl is enough probably to kill the fentanyl if it was misused or toxic. So it's here, it's cheap, it's prolific, and you know, it's a problem. And a lot of it comes from other states. There's a lot of major efforts going on even internationally right now to hopefully slow the precursors that are coming into Mexico with the cartels from China to be able to deal with that. If you look at the Department of Homeland Security, it's one of the major efforts right now to do. Um, it's a huge concern. You know, I mean, we're losing 100,000 people across this country every single year on average for them all over those. And, uh, you know, it, it needs to be more of a topic because, uh, you know, it really talks about what it is. But that kind of segues into some of the new programs we're looking at. We're working with Mercy Mental Health or with Mercy Hospital, Access Mental Health, SOAR, which is the Southwest Opioid Response District, to be able to get some lead support for inpatient treatment centers here in Colorado, a medical detox here in Southwest Colorado, uh, Psych 1 level uh, uh, psychiatric institute here. Southwest Colorado, right? And we have all this need because all we're doing is shipping people out to the Grand Junction College for its level of ever. We're taking up their resources when we don't have our own resources here. And so, you know, that's that would solve a lot of our problems. We have some, some place to take people that are in need to break these cycles because if we can break the cycle, then we don't have to deal with them on the back end. But not everybody that is dealing with addiction or mental health needs to be criminalized, and that's kind of the old system of how to deal with it. Jails aren't equipped for it, we're not equipped for it, even though we continue to try to expand our programs to so like our co responder uh, model that other agencies across the state continue to try to be <coughs> successful as we have. Um, the only reason we've made it successful is because our community is here, is seeing the, the benefit of what that is. So, um, well, that's a big one. You know, uh, a couple of other updates from PD, just we're looking at is. Uh, We've got a Bearcat. I don't know if anybody knows what Bearcat is, but it's it's a rescue vehicle. It's an up armor rescue vehicle. Um, it's a huge asset for us and for our region. Sheriff's Office has one as well. There's a little bit different model of ours, but this allows us to be able to get our officers into a place, um, you know, if, if it's the worst day of everybody's life, we need to get people out. Right? So it's, it's a tool that is going to provide a huge margin of safety for, for our department for this community as a whole. So that was a, a major investment, and uh, it's, it's a major benefit to the organization, and hopefully it's one of those things that we never have to use, but we do have it, and it gives us a greater amount of confidence to respond. Uh, uh, Facility-wise, everybody knows that the 9R campus is going to be for the entire municipal, and to include PD and everybody else. Um, from the drill about that up. This is exciting for us because um, right now our staff enrolled in the police department, we're stagnant. We can't really grow anymore. We have absolutely no room to put anywhere. 
We don't have a place to park cars. We don't have to convert it. every closet. We cut every office in two. I mean, you know, our workspace is continuing to get smaller and smaller. We can't, we can't do stuff, right? For the most part, we will get creative. We'll try to figure out some other ways to do that. But essentially, without this facility, the community is going to continue to grow. We've seen this, 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 our, our drainer community go from a, a small mountain town to really kind of a city with big city issues. Our police department needs to keep pace with that. And until we get the facilities, we're kind of hamstrung with that. Um, so November next year is going to go on the ballot initiative for the old five reallocation of the tax and sales tax. Um, it's real important we get behind that without facilities, you know, all of our municipal um, departments are really kind of stagnant. So we need to get this thing moving forward on that one. So that's my pitch on it. Uh, I mentioned uh, threat teams and such. There's other technologies out there that we're looking at right now. We've got a couple of fatalities with, with traffic's problem, right? Would anybody agree that traffic's problem? Okay. Yeah, is this our thing is not designed uh, to digest enough traffic to you know. Um, so we're looking at different alternatives and solutions on that. And it's been suggested from the community and start looking at red light cameras and, and speed cameras in certain areas. So we're starting to collect the data on that and starting to research this a little bit because those things work 24 7. And like the police officer, you just take that and this and too much and go to the business and go to training site. These are actually out there. And so we're going to start exploring that technology to try to enhance the safety of our roadways as well. Um, so we don't maybe prevent some of these, you know, the traffic events and the pattern over the course of the summer um, with veterans and vehicle incidents. Um, those are not just a problem here, but across the state, it's been about a four percent increase, I think, across the state. Incidents of um, so there's a lot of factors to that. There's been a lot of looking how the cars are getting on bikes and skateboards and scooters now, and all the right interaction doesn't really necessarily work cool. And mental health, this is a big one. Uh, access is here. And uh, we, we, we've got a couple of speaking engagements. But Bodie Miller was here. Um, I spoke at Rotary about two weeks ago talking about this topic. Um, I presented at the FBI National Academy really this summer on this topic as well. It's huge. Um, it's something that I think you know, communities continue to do a much better job of recognizing and systematizing. Um, even within our profession, it's really not really not a difficult conversation to have. We're really becoming much more resilient with that. So we support each other and continue to support that conversation in the efforts of, of organizations such as Access to you know, make this more of a, a, a everyday occurrence that people need to see. Because um, this can't just going to make us much more resilient than we go. And then, in closing, real quick, because I know I'm rambling on, I got a lot of information going on here. Last time I spoke, I talked about uh, the cost of crime, what the cost of crime is across the state of Colorado. And the last time I mentioned this, I was kind of flabbergasted by it. But the report that came out a couple years or last year was the cost of crime in Colorado is $27 billion. Okay. Economic resilience and crime go hand in hand. And we're talking, you know, a $27 billion impact last year. And what that means across our state, I mean, that's more than the state's annual budget. Okay. That's the impact of what it is. When I talk about the cost of crime, I'm talking about victim services, cost of prosecution, we're talking about the cost of funding law enforcement agencies, um, hospitals when somebody is injured, you know, on and on and on. There's, there's so many factors involved in it. Uh, they also look at, you know, if someone dies, you know, what was their income earning potential moving forward? The person's incarcerated with theirs, you know, so there's a lot of those economic factors that they go into that. Last year's study went up another three billion dollars. We're up to thirty billion dollars now, you know, just to call around the world. So this is a major thing that we can invest on, drive some of that down. Uh, you know, it, it, it benefits the entire community because this is a cost that everybody shares. And the governor this year is pushing a major crime initiative where he wants to make Colorado um, one of the it's not a lot more, but in the top ten safest states. And he's invested up in, in several. Million dollars to try to fund police officers and departments of technology. <laughs> really, really, really better. So, um, they're still in the impact at the state level. It definitely trickles down. And you know, for us, you know, maybe it's not the actual impact of crime itself, but it's definitely the perception of crime that affects our quality of life. And we want to make sure that it's truly the quality of life in the city of Durango or the surrounding area. That's what's possible to do because that's what we're here. Uh, kind of all I got today. Uh, if there's any specific questions or anything like that, they can either hang out or fill them down. Grab you after the
Thank you, Chief. John Harper. John, I know you have slides. If I could move them through if you want, if you tell me or you're welcome to do it yourself. Okay, yeah, I think between Andy and I, we'll okay. figure it out. Space for the events. Space for the events. Okay. Um, everybody, uh, I know like a lot of you, my name is John Harper. I'm with the Mayor of Railways. Uh, you guys may know me through like the railroad here in town. Uh, that's one of like our companies. In addition to like, the railroad, we've got um, other railroads throughout the country. We have a theatrical production company. We have a hotel. We started the rodeo series, and like the list like goes on. And really, you know, what we found is like everything we do really is based on like three principles: and that's preservation, education, and entertainment. And so with that, we actually went uh, move forward and we acquired a new company here recently. What's interesting is the acquisition was actually uh, it's based on the three principles, but we were led to it by actually Ted. And so it was a uh, it was funny. I was. I think I was traveling like at the time, and uh, Ted called me. He's like, John, he's like, I'm in like the real estate business, and it's a sweet property that kept like for sale. And he's like, I don't know if it's a property we buy and flip, or do we, or do we run like a business? He said, if it's a business, it's probably more your realm. If it's something that we want to buy and flip, you know, maybe we'll work, to, maybe we'll work on it like, together. Well, after spending time on it, um, it turned out, I was like, you know what? This is a property that we just go in there and flip, and they actually kind of run it like a business. And so with kind of our past and using those three principles, we move forward and uh, we actually bought a ranch. <laughs> and so uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about the ranch and what we're doing with it um, and uh, the future possibilities. And so uh, it's called Tuxedo Beach in Hesper's Colorado. And so uh, when we were first out there, uh, there's only one person who's actually running the ranch at the time. The ranch is significant property. It's got facility to almost 200 horses on site. Um, it has events where hundreds of people can come out there, ride. Um, it's got boarding. I mean, there's a big list that actually is going to go through here soon. Um, and uh, when he first walked in the door, the one employee was like, oh, by the way, I'm leaving in two weeks. And I was like, oh, no, this is a good. I was like, we you want you to stay. Don't, don't do that. And so uh, long story short, we were able to persuade that one person to stay. And uh, I think they're happy. <laughs> <laughs> and so really with that i'll kind of pass it over and we're going to talk a little bit about the ranch and uh, what our future plans are well my name is Haley Chumley, and i'm the ranch manager out here at tuxen ranch and like john said i was here previously um and so now i've continued on and we've been able to really grow what the ranch is doing what we want to do with the community with the ranch and just kind of hitting all the different things with the events and the boarding you know trying to reach out to local rodeo team ffa 4-h all that stuff to really make it a place that the whole community can utilize whether it's ag or equine or even dog agility i gotta call this media about that so um we're really trying to grow and figure out you know what we can do to help make this ranch become something that everyone can utilize and we did hire another employee, so I'm not the only one anymore. <laughs> so uh, Josh is out there, and he takes care of all the chores, and you know, he's a super awesome guy. Anybody, feel free to stop by, and we'll give you a story if you're not seeing it. Thank you, Josh, and all the horses that we've got out there. Um, just like a brief history of the ranch, it's been, it was built in 05 out there in Hesperus, and it's been kind of passed around to different people, different owners, and each one of those owners kind of put a different spin on what they wanted to do. So they built different buildings and different facilities to it, which then made what we've got now. Um, so with the amenities that we have, I'll just kind of run through them briefly. We've got over 160 show stalls. There's two barns that we board in. Um, we can probably board up to 30 or 40 horses long term. Um, we've got a little mare motel people come in to travel in. They have hookups for their living quarters, trailers. We've got stalls they can rent overnight. And then when they're passing through the community, it's a good place to stop. And um, we've got some Airbnbs and three really nice arenas. One can go super handy in the wintertime, especially out here, um, that people can utilize. And so that's been a really cool field. There's trails and different things like that. So. Uh, just kind of a brief overview of the Airbnbs. There's four on the property. There's a big executive house, uh, and then there's a condo, and there's two studios, and then we've got a clubhouse that everyone can use with a pool table and Wi-Fi and all that stuff. So if they're here with their families or want to do like a little birthday party or anything like that, we've got the space for them to do that. Um, with the boarding, uh, we're still open. We've got some different stalls available for boarding. We actually just went through and renovated one of our barns so we can open that one up and have it be a good, safe place for people to their horses. Uh, we've got self-care and full board options. 
get the hay from uh, Ignatius, so it's, it's good, it's local hay, uh, you know, good bedding from crop and different things like that. They've got a lot of amenities that they can use, oversized tack rooms, and it's really turned into like a little barn family more, more than anything. Um, so the events that we've done in the past, which we want to continue to grow and expand, some of the ones that we've done, we've put on barrel races, there was a big cutting that was really successful. There was 160 horses there for two weeks. Um, so that was a really big one. There's cows in and out, in and out. So that was good. We've done a livestock judging contest for the 4-H before in the indoor arena. We've had show jumping and dressage. Talked about the dog agility trial, which I hopefully will have this coming year. And that's going to be 300 dogs out there for three days and 100 people. So definitely come and watch that because that's going to be that's new money. <laughs> Um, we've done like the Cattlemen's Association dinners and things like that, different clinics and things. So, you know, any, any type of event that the community wants to have out here, you know, we're ready, we're equipped, we're excited to put it on. So definitely reach out if there's something that you guys want to see. Um, do you want to talk yeah. About this one? And really, you know, I mean, like we, like we always talk about, you know, like, what are we going to do with it? Well, we do boarding, we do the events. I mean, we have that big list that Haley just went through. But really, we want to, we want to make it a place where you know we do more than just that, and I'm going to say more than just like ourselves, <laughs> and really yeah. have a place for like the community. And so we actually are working on like a bunch of different programs right now with different universities, colleges, and educational programs to really get kids more involved. And so uh, you know, just talk about some of those. Like right now, we're actually working up in, uh, in Wyoming. Uh, in the program. Lamar, Colorado. So okay. I went to school out there in southeastern Colorado, and they've got a cult starting program that I went through. So they take these kids. You've got three semesters of starting a cult from the ground up. Uh, I think you start three cults within those three, and then your last semester of your sophomore year, you get placed in an internship. So you get to pick where you go. I went down to Texas, and I did a breeding program down there. It was super cool, and I learned a lot. But we want to be a spot that those kids can come out. They can kind of see the business side of of the horse industry, not just the cleaning up, which is good. <laughs> They get to see the different aspects of it, the marketing and the advertising and the growing and, you know, with John and Al and everybody that's been so involved and so helpful, it's, it really runs different than your typical ranch does. So it's, it's a cool way for those kids to see how they can make something successful within the equine industry. Yeah. So with like those programs that we're already working on currently, we are upgrading the facility like right now. Um, we're also acquiring new equipment uh, to be able to put on different trainings, different seminars and clinics and so forth out there. Um, and you know, really trying to have a, uh, a, a community outreach program that um, the equine, horse, cattle like industry is more involved. You know, and it's a place where people can come out, whether we come out to our property or whether we bring things here like to town. Um, you know, we really want to re-engage the people with like the Western culture. And so, uh, you know, really with that, uh, you'll see us more and more, uh, whether it's myself, Haley, you know, like our staff like out there, uh, be more engaged and uh, develop new partnerships and new, uh, just new relationships. Uh, we started like a rodeo business about 10 years ago. So True West Rodeo, that's here in town every Wednesday night during uh, like the, the summertime. And now Pam takes that and she uh, she runs that day to day. Um, and uh, like I said, this property can't be available and it just continues to reinforce the importance of uh, whether it's cattle, whether, uh, whether it's horses, goats, sheep, and so on. It gives a place for kids to really grow. You know, like it's interesting, I was actually out in Nashville like this weekend. Uh, there's, a, there's a winter series rodeo like out there. And uh, I was talking to the stock contractor that brings in all like, the calves. And uh, there's a resurgence currently in the younger generation where more and more people are wanting to learn how to ride, whether it's ride for fun, whether it's just hop on a horse. And so, you know, like we really want to have, uh, have a location where we can do that. We can teach, we can, we can educate and be safe and, you know, give people like that true Western experience and culture. So you'll continue to see us and we'll continue to grow, expand, and uh, we're here to help. So if you want um, anything, whether it's equine cattle or so forth, please like reach out and we'll to help you. Out. So, yeah. Any questions? Yep. Yeah. Great. Stand back. <laughs> All right. Uh, reiterate Mike's warning. We might run a few minutes past the top of the hour. Great trouble, Anis. Wait, you don't like your picture? No. <laughs> <laughs> Hi all, my name is Rachel Lannis here with the Big Creek Collective. And thanks so much for having us. This is Tiffany Chacon, who's our child care project manager. 
Um, so we're here today um, on the invitation to talk a little bit about our child care and language justice initiative and how those tie in support workforce and potentially economic development. If you're not familiar with the Good Food Collective, we have the same footprint as Region 9. We work across southwestern Colorado, working with everyone from farmers to distributors, food business, policymakers, food access providers, and we're working together to build a more just and resilient food system. The why behind that is it's a way to sustain meaningful workforce opportunities, a way to support business, certainly a way to sustain and uh, conserve our resources, and also just a way to build a more vibrant and healthy community. So we're talking today about our Food Equity Coalition. It's a project of the Food Collective. It's focused specifically in Maplata County, um, and within that, it's really looking more at that food justice, food access side of things. And so, as its title implies, the coalition is a group of um, community members, agency representatives, business reps, uh, folks from nonprofits, you name it, who are all working together to create a, a county in which everyone has access to food that supports their well being. And really, by addressing kind of those back end systems that are keeping the problem in place. And, of course, it's not too good. All right. And so, in our particular region, um, when we talk about who's impacted most by food insecurity, it's really our Latino community, our communities of color, um, our seniors, and our rural and frontier communities. And one of the things about the coalition that's a little different than other things is we're all about an equity approach oh, here, appreciate that, in which um, we're saying, okay, for those folks most impacted, let's not just look at the data and see what's happening. Let's put those folks at the forefront and ask them to lead the solutions because they know what it's all about. And when we went out to community to ask, you know, what's going on, what would it take to get you the food that would support your well-being? The community that stood up, raised their hand, and continues to show up to the table is our Latino community. And this is an important community, or part of our uh, population here in La Plata. 13% of our residents identify as Latino or Hispanic. Within that, it's growing at a much higher rate than the community at large. It's 19% growth rate compared to 10% of everyone else. When we look at our children, it's actually 26% of children, zero to six. Again, it's growing at a higher rate compared with the community at large. When we look at the workforce, this is one of the most involved portions of our workforce. They participate at 72%, which is just below the Asian community, which is 84%. So a very involved and critical part of our community. One of the other things that's kind of represented here is that um, one of the things we're finding is that 8% of residents in Laplata County don't speak languages other than English, of that 5% are um, Latinos speaking Spanish. And so um, <clears throat> think about that. You have this huge part of our workforce of participants, perhaps there's a language barrier. Anyway, so when we asked, we went to these communities saying, what would it take to have food that supports your well-being, this food justice lens? We did not hear food pantries or greater access to SNAP benefits. Instead, what we heard are upstream issues that are addressing some of these root causes that lead to the inability to access food or financial security. And so the biggest things we heard were representation, power, and belonging. I want to be able to show up somewhere and feel like I'm seen and heard and that my opinions matter. Child care so that I can go to work so I can pay for groceries or that when I'm at work, I'm fully attentive and present and productive or so that my kids, it's a quality issue, my kids get to show up at kinder at an equal footing as everyone else so we can start breaking these poverty cycles so we can continue to build the workforce of the lot of county. Similarly, language justice, so that if I do want to sign up for SNAP benefits, let's say, when I show up at the agency, I can do so, or if I want to apply for a job, um, I can have ask questions in the language I'm most comfortable and understand, um, or potentially language justice so that if you know, city council is having a conversation about housing, which I is happening, um, I can show up and I can make my comments heard so that that's considered as well. And then certainly financial health and opportunities, access to jobs that are paying a more livable wage um, and where there's more meaningful opportunity. <laughs> and so based on all of that, 
we took those initiatives and we formed kind of cross-sectoral, multi-stakeholder um, work groups that are addressing each of those issues. We're here today to talk about two of those. The first being a language justice group. So this is again, a multi-sector group that over the last three years has drilled down and is really kind of focusing on that 8% of the population that wants to participate, but perhaps can't because of some language barriers. So there's two major initiatives they're working on. The first is cultivating a local interpreter pool. So we learned that there was one certified court interpreter between here and Grand Junction, trying to serve all that need that Chief Rayard talked about. And so um, at the same time, we have a massive pool of talent here that didn't have the opportunity to do. So we've been working to provide training and bring that talent to the forefront and create new local business. So I think we've had over 30 interpreters go through initial training, and right now we're working on the business coaching and support side of things, so that if any of you all need interpretation or translation support, you can get that locally as opposed to contracting with them. Um, and then the second big part of that is working with businesses such as yourself, governments otherwise, to help you all adopt and practice language justice. So I think we have over 100 different agencies and orgs um, attend trainings. Uh, we provide one-on-one -on -one coaching. We have a bunch of toolkits available. So if you're like, who are those local interpreters? You can find them on our website. Or I want to do this. I need a job application translated. How do I do that? You can also find those. Um, and then we do have a pool of translation and interpretation. Um, should you need some, and we don't have one. I'll hand off to Tiffany to talk about job here. Thank you. Yes. So thank you guys for having us. I heard many common themes as I was listening to everybody. Speaking about supporting our workforce, supporting a thriving life for our community members here, and even touching on that mental aspect as well. Right now, what we're seeing, one of those big numbers, and I want you to notice, this is also um, in response to a recent report that the Economic Alliance supplied as well. We have 66% of our children here in the public county are in need of childcare um, because all of their parents are working, and we have a 60% gap in that child care space. So those children are going somewhere, they're not necessarily going to the best quality, safe space. And when we're thinking about your workforce, it's difficult, even many of you as parents, it's difficult to work, not knowing if your child is safe, is developing correctly, and having the financial barriers as well. Um, so we came together with the Latino community to do a deep dive into what's, what really are those barriers for child care. And we did a big report that we found available for you guys to see out of that report, identifying those barriers, we created a strategic plan that is really cross-sector. Um, and with that strategic plan, we're looking at three main goals, increasing accessibility, affordability, and cultural celebration. Um, one example is currently at this time, there are only two private preschool programs or child care programs that have enrollment, paperwork, and Spanish. And so we're really looking at how we can create some big system changes so that access is there. Um, and also, of course, increasing the spots. We know that our workforce needs that spot today, too. And so we do have a task force, which I see many of our partners here in this room. I invite you guys to come and join us. We have our next meeting on Tuesday morning at 9 a.m. That's the 21st. So if you want to come and see how you can help change childcare so we can support our workforce, I encourage you to come in and I'll be here at the end as well if you have any questions about what we're doing and how we're changing childcare for Wapata County and for that workforce, our Latino community that really is here to work. They're one of those highest workers and really are big big barriers. Awesome. Thanks so much. Thank um, you. Any resources for the child care reports, a strategic plan, you can go to our website to the resources page that has a bunch of things available. And then I'm here to chat and just things. As you know, there's one grant that just opened we want to share with you. It's employer focused. Um, and maybe we can share that at this point too. I mean, it's something about your list. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I'm Senator Hickenlooper's office. Sure. Go for it. We will have your picture before you know it. <laughs> yeah. Take one now. Um, so thank you for having me. Let me get my notes. Um, so yeah, as I said, I'm the uh, new Southwest Regional Director for Senator Hickenlooper. Um, I just started two months ago, and then as you can probably tell, we're going on leave here. <laughs> 
um, since I'm now full part. Um, but uh, um, we'll make sure that everyone in Laquata County in the region is in good hands. Um, uh, the point person for Senator Bacon Member's office while I'm out on leave is going to be as Azarel Madrigal, who is awesome. Um, many of you know her already. She used to be the executive director of her Southwest. Foundation. Um, so, just a couple of announcements from Senator Hickenlooper um, that per that directly pertain to Wolfata County. Um, one is um, Colorado was designated as an official U.S. tech hub for quantum technology. So, um, the reason I bring that up is, you know, while you may think, oh, that's over on the front range, actually, Fort Lewis College is part of that collaborative. So that's gonna be bringing in um, tens of millions of dollars over the course of the next um, five years or so to really establish this new tech field in our state. And we're really excited of how Fort Lewis Public involved with that. We are too. Maybe you've already announced that sister. Um, no. Uh, but yeah. I so learned about it yesterday. Oh. Oh, shoot. <laughs> um, uh, so Senator Hickenlooper worked really hard to uh, even just get that established. So ever since he was mayor of Denver and governor for eight years, um, and now as uh, um, a committee member of the Commerce Committee in the Senate, he worked hard to write and pass the Chips and Science Act, which um, housed the, the tech program that it is. And so now we're just seeing all that money he does me it out and it's going to actually fit our community too. Very exciting. Um, the other thing that I am hearing a lot of buzz about here um, in this region is artificial intelligence. Um, you know, the, there's, um, you know, how that is going to interact with our businesses. So the Senator has been actually chairing um, subcommittee hearings on artificial intelligence and how it intersects with um, cybersecurity as, and privacy, as well as how we can actually have it be working hand in hand with our workforce and not, you know, I think there's a lot of fear that's going to be replacing humanity and that's just simply not the case. So, um, you know, there's going to be um, lots of conversations with, you know, figuring out how to, you know, if and when and how to um, have policies around that. but. You know, it is something to also embrace. Um, um, and then last but not least, um, actually, no, not last, but a few quick. So, um, Senator Hickenlooper um, uh, introduced the Retirement Savings for Americans Act. It's a bipartisan bill. Um, he introduced it last month. And I bring that up because it is for people who don't have access to an employer. Um, retirement savings account. So we that we're impacted by this because we have a large gig economy. You know, people who don't have access to employer savings, uh, retirement savings accounts. So I think nationwide, there are 40 million Americans, about 12% of our population who don't have access. And um, it might even be slightly higher in our communities. So um, we're working hard to help out, you know, Low and low income Americans, you know, Coloradans, make sure that everyone has access to retirement. Um, and um, I'm sure broadband has been discussed in this in these meetings in the past. Um, so there's a ton of federal money coming, you know, being um, is, that my, is that like the Oscars? <laughs> So there's a ton of federal money being funneled through um, our, our state broadband office, um, but really deploying broadband, you know, like building up our infrastructure here all around the state and we desperately need it in many parts on the Western Slope. Um, so uh, there we have been working with partners to identify what those barriers are to this money. One of them was a letter of credit requirement, which is actually just makes it illegal here in Colorado, like uh, cities and counties can't go into debt here. So we worked really hard with lots of stakeholders around the state to make sure that um, people have um, to change that requirement to a performance bond. And now we can actually get that bond. 
Um, and um, we're working on a couple of other hurdles too. Um, and lastly, we're so excited that to see the groundbreaking of the Best Western Hotel conversion to affordable housing. Um, that was um, $3 million of congressionally directed spending, but a whole lot of other people doing tons of work. So just want to share our excitement for that project. So that's it. We have two quick updates, announcements. two quick announcements, sorry. First, the Jack Llewellyn from the Chamber of Commerce. So real quick, um, Thursday night is our business after hours out at the uh, Harley Davidson dealership from five o'clock to seven o'clock. Then also mark your calendars. We're doing a chamber day at the Capitol on February 8th, uh, 2024. We'd like to see people get involved from down here in Southwest Colorado. So if you're interested, reach out to myself or Kim at our office, excuse me, office. And then Durango Rocks is uh, coming up on February 29th. So short, sweet, done. I know. And then lastly, Doug McCarthy, local first. And Lauren Barrett. And Lauren. Oh, okay. But you have some things to say. I just wanted to remind you it's open enrollment period for health insurance on the individual and family market. Make sure you don't just auto enroll. You'll get a letter from Connect for Health Colorado and they'll re enroll you December 1st in your plan for this year. But you can save hundreds or thousands of dollars by shopping like a smart consumer. And take a look at Elevate Health Plans, which we're sponsoring in partnership with Peak Health Alliance. You can save. Using that. Yeah. that picture shares how excited I am about Elevate Health. Um, my name is Lauren. I'm the CEO of the Local First. I just had two quick announcements. And one is that our Be Local coupon books, which brings a lot of foot traffic into our local stores and tells your stories, are for sale. They're also for sale and wholesale. Um, so get in touch with us if you're looking to sell the books that you're promoting your businesses in or sharing the stories of your businesses and nonprofit. They are out and they tell a beautiful story about our local uh, independent business economy and communities of movers and shakers. The other thing is, as you know, you hear a lot about Noel Night, another incredible evening to boost our local economy and showcase all the amazing nonprofits and, and partners across town. <clears throat> The, the um, deadline is this week to get into our Herald insert. Uh, it's a really big promotional deal that we do with the Durango Herald. Also, we take all that information from the Durango Herald and what you are registering on our website and we post it all over town. So if you have any questions about that or any last minute events, please get those up online uh, as soon as possible as in today and tomorrow. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for turning around a little bit long. Our next meeting is December 12th. Enjoy the rest of your day. Yeah,